we come to the reading of, our, of Scripture, there will be two places we'll be reading. I'll be dealing with the first uh, this Sunday, and then next Sunday we'll be dealing with the second. Turn with me, if you will, first to Genesis 3. We'll be reading verses 1 through 15. Hear the word of the Lord. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, From the, tree of, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat. From it or touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely shall not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord, walk, Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard, the vo- I heard the sound of thee in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I have commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gavest to me uh, to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. That sends our Old Testament reading. If you'll turn now with me to the New Testament, uh, and we'll be reading Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. If you're using the Pew Bible, it's uh, 1143, 1143. And Jesus was led up by the serpent into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city, and he had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels charge concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, On the other hand it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things will I give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Let us pray. Lord, we just lift now 
these passages, and we would just ask as we move forward that you truly would lead us and guide us and that we indeed would be touched this day. For we ask this in your most holy, precious name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. What I've entitled this week and next week, uh, part one and part two, it uh, comes down to, Did God Really Say? Uh, And it's interesting because we're, well, first of all, before I would do that, um, the Lord has a good way of of bringing us uh, to uh, uh, humility. Uh, And the reason I'll say this is because I'm preaching two weeks in a row. There was a time where I did that once before. Now, in the position uh, as a chaplain, when you're young and uh, got hair and are good looking, then you... You tend to uh, do the ministry more. Now when you get old and your hair falls out and you, you don't look so good anymore, you end up doing the supervisory stuff and you don't do so much ministry. Uh, and so I didn't necessarily get a chance to preach all that much. And, uh, but when I was serving at Arlington Cemetery, I attended uh, Alexandria Presbyterian Church down there in Alexandria, Virginia. And this church was interesting. Uh, the the, the uh, Presbyterian church actually met at the Baptist church. Uh, they, they rented it, and so they had their time frame. We, we meet like at 11 is when we do, or we do service like at 930. And that church would do it at 11. Now, that church at that time, their mean age uh, of the individuals in the, po- in the uh, uh, pews was about 60. Uh, no, I'm, I think I may be a little under. It's probably about 70 years old. It was an older congregation. It was dying. Now, the Lord has turned that, that church around, and they actually are doing very well. But at that point, there's probably about maybe 20 in an auditorium that you could probably have about 1,500 in, and the, the mean age was probably about 70. But that pastor, now I'm doing uh, funerals at Arlington, and so Monday through Friday. And so on the weekends, I had a little time uh, available, and so we were attending that church. Well, the pastor of that Baptist church uh, knew that I, that I was uh, ordained, and so he came to me and said, look, I'm going to be gone for two weeks. Would you preach for me? Kind of like what's happening now, where Dave says, hey, I'm going to be gone. Why don't you do the preaching? I said, okay, I'll do that. But I told him, I said, after the first one, I said, the first week I'm going to have to leave. I, I, I got to preach and go. Sorry about that. Is that okay? He said, no problem. I just need you to preach. I said, great. So I did that. So I preached, left. Then the next day, or the next Sunday, when I, after I preached, I had time. And so I was walking back. I was shaking hands. I was at the door, people out. And there was a little old lady. Again, the Lord has a way of, hum- of humbling us. Because this little old lady looks at me, and she goes, oh, pastor, thank you so much. You were great today. The guy that we had last week wasn't very good. (laughs) But you were great. I've been asked that I tell her that it was me. No, I didn't. I I did not do that. Uh, But uh, it was very interesting to say it. So uh, let me just say to you, I'll be here next week. So (laughs) hang around for the second one. It might be a lot better than the first one. But it is interesting, uh, God has a way of, of putting us in the right frame of mind. Uh, he really does. And, and that's one thing that I've become more convinced of, uh, is the soul sufficiency of Christ. We can no, nowhere else in him and him alone. What we're going to do here is, again, and, and where this kind of came from, the first time, this is actually not the first time that I preached this, where I preached this the first time was, uh, the Air Force, uh, in its infinite wisdom, realized that I needed more edumacating. And they sent me uh, on a, what we call it's AFIT Air Force Institute of Technology uh, a civ- to a civilian institute. I went to Boston University. For those of you who are not familiar with that, it's in Boston. Uh, and uh, when I was up there, it was an interesting, it was a, really a, a great opportunity um, One of the things at Boston University, in Boston, there's a consortium. There's many, many uh, universities and colleges up there. And so you have the opportunity, particularly in the theological area, to go to many other institutions. And being there, I said to myself, if I'm here and I don't go to Harvard, uh, I, you know, this is a great opportunity. And so I did. I actually took a course at Harvard Divinity School. 
I took a course at Harvard Law School. Um, and I won't tell you how I did. No, I did actually pretty decent. Um, but the interesting thing, and this is where this kind of came from. In fact, I was talking earlier with, with David, uh, and as we were looking at it, Harvard University was first established for the proclamation of the gospel. When I was there, the name of Jesus isn't even mentioned. It was interesting, at least at Boston University, there was a discussion about Jesus. You know, uh, at Harvard, it was totally, totally abandoned. And it began for me to think, and, and, I, and I would encourage you too, as we go through this today, to realize the importance that is there of, did God really say? And as we look at this passage, there are several actors on the stage that we're going to see, particularly here in Genesis 3. Next week, we're going to look at the recreation and that temptation of Jesus and what he does. But in this, as we begin, the, and, and these actors are that of Satan, that of the woman, and that of the man. And also we see God here. So let us begin to delve into this text. Let us look first at Satan. As we look at verse 1, we see as a serpent. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now some would question and sit here and say, hey, well, what, what, was he really a serpent? Well, I'd say to you, the text says it was. Now do understand something. It is a serpent, but it's clearly Satan working through it. In Revelations 12, John would say, And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. John understood what was going on there. Likewise, Paul in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3 and also verse 14, where he said, But I am afraid lest as the serpent deceived Eve, by his craftiness, your mind sh should be led astray from the simplicity and the purity of devotion to Christ. Likewise, in the 14th verse of that chapter, no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Jesus also, in John 8, would speak concerning the Jews of saying, you are your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. And whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And it's interesting here, so that yes, it is a serpent, but it is indeed Satan working through it. And this also, understanding this, shows the even greater contempt of the fall. For man had dominion over the earth and all the animals, but yet man heeds this one, this animal, to break the commandment of God. You know, it's interesting too because man knew God. He knew God well. And he knew the animals. But yet, he listens to the voice. In fact, we clearly see the mark of the evil spirit here. Where the serpent is speaking. Now, do you understand, again, did Adam have the animals come before him? And yet as he did, there was none like him. And yet here is a serpent that is speaking. In Deuteronomy, it talks about that if the voice comes, if a prophet or a dreamer arises saying, follow any, do other things, but what God has told you, you're not to believe. You're not to follow that person. Likewise, in 1 John 4, verses 1 through 3, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. But this... By this you know the Spirit of God, that every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming, and now is already in the world. Knowing God and knowing what he has said in his promises, yet here, listening, clearly that which is contrary to what God has said. And so we see Satan here working through the serpent. Likewise, as we look at this passage, we see the methods that the tempter uses. Here in the first verse, the questions that are given, where he exaggerates 
the command that God gave, where he says, Did God say, You shall not eat of every tree? He exaggerates it, taking this command, exaggerating it so he then can discredit it. In fact, it's very dangerous for us to even listen to those things. And it's also interesting, too, because as we go on here, that as he speaks in verse 2, that what he's saying is that there's no danger, that the exaggeration diminishes the consequences, that, hey, there really is no danger here if you end up breaking this, that might be breaking a precept, that we might be breaking a precept or a law here, but there really will be no penalty or cost. And it's interesting because as one has written where he says, Satan teaches man first to doubt and then to deny. And he makes them skeptics first and so by degree makes them atheists. It's interesting because you see this clearly in the example of the parables in Matthew 13 that Jesus gives where he, we see that once the master has sown the seed, Satan comes afterwards and sows tares. And wheats. And we also see here in verse 5 that there was much advantage to disobeying God. Where he says to Eve, your eyes shall be opened. That you shall be as gods. And that you should know good and evil. And that all this would come In fact, that the Lord was keeping this from you and that all of this would come if you would but just do, if you would but just listen. And do understand, what is the target here? The target is the insinuation to bring first discontent. Discontent with the present state of which they were in. As if it was that, 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 that God was not giving them everything that they needed. This idea that grass is always greener on this other side. Well, just so you're aware of, it could be that the septic tank may be overflowing on the other side, and that's why the grass is greener. In fact, I'd encourage to say that that's usually the case. And secondly, here, that the idea, the ambition of preference, that I am fit to be God. You know, that, that aspect of humility that God brings to us, that, hey, I'm a lot better than I truly am. Again, this idea that God is withholding something from them. It's interesting here, there's a a theologian, his name is Pink, and I I really appreciate this guy, and he has to say this, with this idea that God was withholding, kind of as a tyrant, withholding from man something which would be advantageous to him. And he presents as his bait the promise that if only Eve will believe his lie rather than God's word, she shall be the gainer and the obtainer of a knowledge and wisdom previously denied her. Indeed, the lie is put to the woman. And what happens? And so we see the second player on the stage, and we look at the woman here in verse 2 and 3, where she says, from the fruit, her answer to to the serpent, to Satan, for the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it lest you die. There's a problem here. What is that problem? Do understand, when God said it, did he say that you were not to touch it? She's added something to it, hasn't she? It's also interesting because what she says here, lest you die, what did God say? You shall surely die. A blunting even of that, muting the threat. It's interesting, too, when you talk about adding. When we think about Jesus and the the Jews, the Pharisees and and the Sanhedrin, why did they put him to death? He claimed to be God, but what was the other one? He broke the Sabbath. He didn't break the Sabbath. He broke their Sabbath the way they. And they were adding to it. 
And it is very important for us to understand that it is God's word, not what we add to it. So often that can lead us to difficulty. Indeed, the actions of the woman, or for that matter, mankind, because we can place ourselves in this situation, each and every one of us, no matter what our gender. That when the woman saw, here in verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. You understand here what is going on. She saw the physical appealing to the bodily senses. It was good for food. And often as we sit there, it's good for food. How could God deny that to us? The emotions, the delight of the eye appealing to that desire nature which has its seat in our soul. A great deal of sin comes in at the eyes, at the windows Satan throws in those fiery darts which pierce and poison the heart. In fact, dare I even say, one of the biggest things that haunts the church today, by the way, is pornography. And where does that come through? It comes through the eye. We do understand the pervasiveness of this is amazing. And it is outside of the will of God. But we also see the mental, desirable to make one wise, appealing to the intellect, which also has its center in the spirit. It's interesting, Colossians 2, 1 through 4, talks about the true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom are are, are, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I say this in order that no one may, be delude, may delude you with pervasive arguments. Paul driving home that point that it is in Christ and Christ alone so that no one may delude you with pervasive arguments. And that's exactly what is coming here, a pervasive argument. So she saw. Then what did she do? She took. Now do understand something. For those, there are some of us in the room that can... Probably the younger ones, you'll say, what in heaven's name are you talking about? Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it. That that show, it was a TV show, great comedian. uh, Flip Wilson was an interesting fellow, but there was one one skit that he did where he always, with his his answer, he'd do something he really wasn't supposed to do, and he always say, the devil made me do it. And you know what? We like to say that, don't we? But do understand something. When Eve saw and she took, Satan did not put that fruit in her hand. She did. She did. Satan may tempt, but he cannot force. He may persuade us to cast ourselves down, but he cannot cast us down. In fact, it's one of the reasons we will look next week at Matthew 4. And we see what Christ does as the second Adam. She saw, she took And she ate. You know, it is possible that she may not have intended to do that. That when she looked to take, nor when she took to eat. But this indeed was the result. It is interesting to know the beginning of it is as the breaking forth of water. To which it is hard to say, here you shall come and no further. How often do we have that line that we put, oh, I'm not going, but we'll tow that line. We'll come right up to that line. It is therefore important, I think, therefore for us, as one theologian has said, therefore it is our wisdom to suppress the first emotions of sin and to leave it off before we meddle with it. But it's interesting here, not only did she saw, she took, that she ate, that she gave. She gave it also to her husband with her. Those that have themselves done ill are commonly willing to draw in others to do the same. As was the devil, so was Eve. No sooner a sinner than a tempter when she comes and brings that fruit. 
Again, Pink makes an interesting point here, and I would share it with you because I think it really highlights this very well. He says this, We learn a deeply important fact, that Satan works from out to in, outward, inward, which is the very reverse of the divine. God works inward, and it goes out. God begins his work in man's heart, and the change wrought there reacts and transforms the outward life. But Satan begins with the external and through the bodily senses and emotions of the soul works back to the soul. The reason for this being that normally he has not direct access to man's spirit as God has. And I would say to you, through the power of God, that if we are working in that, of thwarting that which he has, indeed for us to guard our soul by filtering what our senses tell us by the word of God. But we also see here on this this stage, not only the serpent and Satan, the woman, but we also see the man. Now do understand something. There's a note I think that needs to be said here. First Timothy really uh, proclaims to us, Paul said that woman is deceived first, but Romans 5 shows that the fall of man is in Adam. What does that mean? That we have mutual interaction or mutual guilt here. That both are partakers in this. And it isn't, you know, so often, oh, you know, just as we see here, what happens when God comes to Adam and says, what did you do? That woman. And then when he comes to the woman, ah, that serpent. We're always pointing somewhere else. But what we have here indeed is, Mutual guilt is spread upon all, just as Romans tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, do understand here, as we look at this passage, it says, gave also to her husband with her. Now, there are those who would say that Adam was with her in the tempting. Calvin has spoken to this, and he says he doesn't believe that to be the case. I also would not believe that. And the reason being is Ecclesiastes 4.12 says this, if one can overpower him if, uh, who is alone. Two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. One of the things that is a common thing is divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. But the thing is here is definitely as we look at the passage, as we look at the text, is that he is with her either when she is taking the fruit or after she has eaten eaten the fruit. He was there. But the thing that we need to understand is that he is also doing the exact same thing that Eve is doing. Because as he is watching this, he is seeing. He then takes the fruit from her hand. And then he eats. He eats. And the interesting thing here is the prohibition is clear that he was not to eat. And yet he does. And as mentioned before, the fall and the curse are upon Adam as our federal head, and him and him alone. He is the first Adam. In Christ, the second Adam, our federal head, does salvation come. But it's interesting here because in the fall, and it is from Adam where this comes, what are the effects? I did not read it, but 17 through 19 say this. Then to Adam he said, and have, uh, and he said, and then he goes on, he says, and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it. This is the effect. Cursed is the ground because of you, Adam. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, but thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. In fact, as God said there, because you listened to the voice of your wife. Now do understand, because you listened to the voice of the tempter. And it's not the wife. It is the lie of Satan that is here. Because you listened to that lie, to do what I commanded you not to do. His actions. 
again, was, as you think about it, pushing the blame off of saying, well, it wasn't me, it was the woman that you gave me. But the woman did not make him do it. He did. He took it in his hand, he took the fruit, and he ate it. And indeed, the curse comes through him, as we said, the curse on creation and the curse of death. The death has come. Dust you are from, and dust you will return. Where is the application for us here as we think about, did God really say? Doubt, unbelief, and pride were the roots of the sin of our first parents, both mutually guilty. Let me ask you a couple of questions just if you think about this. Do you know the sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day? Do you? They did. They did. They knew the sound of God. Do you know the voice of God, the audible voice of God? He spoke with them. Who is the one that brought Eve to Adam? God did. There was intimate fellowship here. And when you think about the effects of the fall, when you think about this, you know him, you've you've been with him, and yet when someone comes along that you clearly know is saying something contrary to him, what do you do? You quickly fall in line and rebel against him. And as we look at the effects of of the fall here in this application, understanding that before... Adam eats of the fruit, he doesn't realize that he is naked. But after he eats, he realizes that there is something wrong. To hide his shame. But he also goes and they try to hide the shame. They try to cover it up as best they can. And what what, what they use here is fig leaves. But it's interesting because what do we do to hide the shame? And you can fill that in with a myriad of things that people do. We also see the fear of God, of that of which they hide themselves from him. And it's interesting that God is the one that seeks them out. It is not them seeking out God. And then when we get into the aspect of confessing sin, what is it that they do? It's the blame game. It's the blame game. And I would say to you that the same effects are observable today the world over. When I was in the uh, uh, Sunday school, I, I used, there was a Christian artist, and just sometimes I find it interesting as, as people will write certain things that if you really look at Scripture, that's clearly not there. And I, I'm not endorsing this gentleman in any way, shape, or form. In fact, I encourage you not to listen to him. There's a guy named Billy Joel. If you remember, as I do when I was younger, that he wrote a song. It's called Only the Good Die Young, and essentially trying to entice a young lady out to do things that she shouldn't do. It was interesting because he said many things. He said, come out, Virginia, don't let me wait. Girls start much too late. Sooner or later comes down to fate. I might as well be the one. Locked you away, never told you the price you pay, things that you might have done. It's interesting. He goes on to sit here and really is, is, is being very sacrilegious to the Christian faith. Are you aware of Billy Joel's life? One who sits there and is speaking against the things of God. Yet when you look at his life, uh, it's also interesting too because in the the lyrics that he writes, he says, uh, concerning the mother, he says, you say your mother told you all that I could give you was a reputation. She never cared for me, but did she ever say a prayer for me? You know what? I almost guarantee you that she did. She did. But yet again, this deceptiveness And sitting there and saying the things of God are not there. It's interesting because, again, the life of Billy Jewell. Four marriages. Three ending in divorce. Attempted suicide twice. Hospitalized for substance abuse twice. Depression. Significant. He really has it, doesn't he? The deceptive lies of Satan is to destroy us. And to rob us of the joy that God would have us. And I'm going to use Billy Joel as an example because there are many, many out there. 
many out there that are seeking to move us away. You know, it's interesting too here because when you really think about it, when Eve comes to Adam with the fruit, or as she is eating it before him and offers it to him, what is happening is here is that he is listening to the lies of the world. If he stands on what God has said, he refuses the fruit. What he does is begins to doubt and reason away within himself that God's command is either too harsh, petty, or he does not mean what he says. Essentially, you can fill in the dotted line for yourself. The reason I can say this is because I have done it, and I will do it again and again, just as you have. We, as the children of God, are redeemed by the death, the blood of the one who gave his all for you and for me. We are no better, in fact, worse than our first parents because we have the spirit within us and we still listen to the voice of the tempter and doubt God. And that's one of the reasons why I think that it's, it, it, it's, it, I'm glad to see that we're going to do the Truth Project. Because the Truth Project, what it does is it is speaking not to the world, it is speaking to us. Because what is happening is called syncretism. What is syncretism? It is the melding of ideas and worldviews. And the one thing that Dale Tackett drives home immensely in this is this idea that what is happening is that the church, very insidious. In fact, uh, again, Dave, we were in here prior, was talking about a book. It's called Mission Drift, concerning Harvard University and how by the early 1800s it has drifted away from the proclamation of the gospel where Cotton Mather would start a new university to take its place, Yale. And look at the place of Yale nowadays. Also, it has jettisoned God. Mission drift. And the reason why that is happening, in fact, we also talk as military individuals, the unity of effort and the common goal in working as a team, and the one thing that we cannot do, if we of the church allow the world, the insidious, did God really say? I will guarantee you we will be undone. In fact, we actually are seeing the consequences of that today, by the way, in America, where many churches have totally uh, extinguished the gospel message from their pulpits, from their seminaries. I've seen it in the last 16 years as I dealt with numerous individuals who would claim the name of Christ and yet do not give him glory. But where is the good news? Oh, the good news is that in the proto-euangelium. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. You know, it's amazing as you look at this because God's grace is clearly shown. Before the judgment, when he kicks them out of the Garden of Eden, he proclaims this mercy, the promise. Satan is the catalyst, yes, but he would be undone, that his head would be bruised. Yes, the woman deceived, but from the seed of woman would come the Redeemer. The man who failed the test, the son of Adam, the son of Adam would come and restore, would restore. In fact, man was a creation, special, created in the, in the image of God but now as the children of God participating in the Godhead itself. God, because of who he is, that is what we now enjoy. I would encourage us, in fact, uh, as I am sitting here thinking, which, well, as I'm sitting here, as we are coming on that 500th anniversary, of the Reformation, and thinking of that, what I would encourage us that we would use this year as a Reformation for our hearts. Look at what it is that you do believe. Is it squared with the Word of God? And if it is not, I would encourage you to get with the elders, get with Dave, get with Jack, and talk about it if it is not. 
Because if it is not, I will guarantee you it is the, it is the lies of the world. It is the deception of Satan. Let us not hear, did God really say? And then believe it. Because God did say it. And his word will never go away void. Let this year be one toted to him and him alone. Let us pray. Lord, indeed, may we as your people hear your voice. May we move mightily that we would be truly reforming in our hearts and our minds. For we ask this all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. If you rise for the closing hymn, Almighty God, your word is cast. 383.